I am then going to um, mute you all so we get a really good recording. Let's do that. And I'm going to share my screen. And we will get started. So good evening, everybody. Here we go. I'm Andrea Miller. Hello. So delighted to see you all joining us tonight for another one of our briefings and updates. And we've got a lot of information to go over. So our organization is Center for Common Ground, and I am based here in Virginia. We have a very simple mission. Our mission is to empower underrepresented voters. And because with the exception of Virginia, we don't really have nine elections that we're looking at we are adjusting our direction to help hold the people that just got elected accountable for things that make sense. So without further ado, we are going to get started. So in 2021, in addition to working on the election in Virginia, and there may be some other smaller elections that we work on, we are going to be looking very hard at civic engagement, education, and empowerment. Everything that we do is all about making local communities stronger, making the people that they elected more accountable to them. And that is really what we support. So we've already been introduced. I've got new people tonight on what we are supporting federally. So we've all probably heard about the For the People Act, Voting Rights Advancement Act, as yet unintroduced, DC statehood, that is introduced in both the House and the Senate. Remove the ratification deadline from the Equal Rights Amendment. That is introduced in both chambers. And um, I found a standalone one today, same day registration. Because we are now going to be working very much in civic engagement, we have invested in civic engagement tools. So what you're looking at here is a screenshot of a tool that we got yesterday. Now that tool is called Trackville. So for any of you who are very, very interested in civic engagement, Trackville, T-R-A-C-K-B-I-L-L, is a free app for both iPhone and Android. And it has every bill introduced in the US Congress and the 50 states. Now, out of literally thousands of pieces of legislation, there are some bills that we are very, very interested in. So we talked about DC um, becoming a state and for the people act. So you can see that right now I'm tracking the bill for myself and then we're also tracking the bill for the team. Now, when we say we're tracking a bill, that means anytime this bill gets a new co-sponsor is going to be heard in a committee or in any way, shape or form gets amended, we get an email notification, me and all the members of my team that something has happened on one of our pieces of legislation. And we also, when we're tracking a piece of legislation, 
we can see how many actions have occurred on that piece of legislation. We've got a summary of bills. We know there are 207 members of Congress who support DC statehood in the House. And that bill is going to go through five committees. And this is just the beginning of what we can do with this legislation. Now, we are also tracking legislative priorities in the state. Now, most of you have heard me talking about Georgia has introduced a very bad bill limiting and adding barriers to vote by mail. But also in Georgia, there were a couple of good bills, voter expansion bills, who knew? So they have a support joining the National Popular Vote Comp Act that basically says a state will directly elect the president as opposed to depending on electors from the electoral college. And Georgia also has a bill to support restoration of rights to people who have passed felony convictions. So we now have the ability, just as we could drill down with a voter file and find voters and target voters to text or to call or to postcard, we now have a tool that will allow us to do something just as powerful with legislation. And we also now will be doing outreach to voters in our target states, asking them or making sure they know that their state is introducing some really bad juju bills or their state is introducing some really good things that they might want to support. And while we're having those conversations, if uh, one of the questions we'll ask the voter is, would you like to talk to your house member, your senator, or wherever that bill is? If they say yes, one moment, and I'm going to connect you directly to delegate so-and-so, senator so-and-so. And when we click that button, they now have the ability to talk directly to their legislator. So that is one of the places that we are going. And this is what it looks like for the states. So we have the ability to track legislation in all 50 states. Now, I'm going to be talking later on with Stephen Rosenfeld, and Stephen's going to give us an overview of what is going on in 28 state legislators, legislatures with voting rights and voting bills. And without further ado, Steve, if you would be kind enough, go ahead and unmute yourself and join me. So I want to okay. present Stephen Rosenfeld. He I is, there he is, there he is. He's editor of the voting booth for um, in the Institute for Independent media. He looks just like his picture. <gasps> wow. I got a hair. <laughs> You're wonderful. All right. Now, Stephen, as I mentioned, 28 states have voting bills that have been introduced in this legislative session. So if you want to take it away, I have built a PowerPoint that follows along with your new article that will be coming out soon. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming here and listening and inviting me to, to, to talk. Um, the Brennan Center at NYU Law School periodically issue reports on legislation and they put one out a couple days ago that counted more than 500 bills that have been introduced in the states or were carried over from last session that concern voting rights and the rules 
on and the laws for voting in elections. Now, um, 400 of them are pro voter bills. That means they do things like put into law many of the emergency measures that we saw during the pandemic, such as not having, requiring an excuse for an absentee ballot and giving you more options to get a ballot and ways to return them. But a hundred of them, actually 106, and, and this list is growing by the way, there, that report is, doesn't even include some of the bills that Andrea has on, on the ballot, on the track bill tool. A hundred of them um, are anti-voter bills. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to try to go through these in a very summary fashion and hopefully it won't be overwhelming except there's so many states it gets overwhelming. But what we wanna do here is just have a sense of what's unfolding and then Andrea can jump in and say, hey, in this state we can take it to this next level. Okay, so after the election, after normal elections, Everyone in the policy world, or the voting world, tends to issue reports and say, what do we need next? What do we do next? What's most important? We didn't really have that this year because of the challenges by Trump, the insurrection at the Capitol. And um, what's happened is usually there's a debate on what's most impactful and what has to happen first. And we're really not having that debate. Instead, we're seeing federal legislation being pushed and state, all this state action. So we're really not debating, for example, how to fix the electoral college, presidential transition laws. We haven't really yet debated DC and Puerto Rico statehood. We haven't talked about federal standards for political speech you know, and disinformation. It's all out there, but instead the focus is, is already narrowing. So what, so what is it? Okay. So, so in Congress, there's the, these massive voting reform bills, HR1 and Senate Bill 1. I'm no, all I'm gonna say is they are compendiums of more than 50 bills, some of which have parts that were written in 2007 that never passed because of Republican obstruction. And they in, include everything about voting and they include campaign finance and ethics reforms. And they look like they're on a fast track. At the same time, in the states, you have a somewhat parallel process, but the focus is not as expansive. So there are just, uh, by my sense, there are four or five main areas. And if you're, if there are bills introduced by Democrats, they take one approach. And if they're introduced by Republicans, they take the other. So they concern, as you might expect, because this follows from all the post-election litigation, number one focus access to a mailed out ballot. Now I call them mailed out instead of absentees because the way they are returned is not necessarily in the mail. You can return them in person, you can return them in a Dropbox, you can mail it, you can, so, so, that, so that's the, the mailed out ballot. There were 65 million people who voted with mailed out or absentee ballots last fall. The next, so that's how they're, so that's a big focus. The next is early voting. There was something like 36 million people who voted early in person. That's a focus. Do you keep it? Do you expand it? Or do you reel it in? And then getting a little more into, into the, 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 the starting line, there's do you make voter registration easier or harder? And then to get really into the weeds, but these are the, this is where it gets, the weeds are close to the dirt. This is where it gets dirty. Um, voter purges, will they be prevented or expanded? And there, so, so here, so let's talk first about the expanding participation side. I'm going to be positive first instead of negative first. There are many states who want to allow all voters to get an absentee ballot. No excuses needed. No doctor's note, no work travel, no documentation, nothing. They also require officials to um, contact voters who make mistakes when they fill out the envelope so they can fix them. So the envelope is not thrown out, it's opened and the ballot is counted. They expand the use of drop boxes and they, and they process return ballots as soon as they come in. And that's really important because the delays in states after November that didn't start until election day, that created a vacuum and that vacuum was filled by all that litigation. Okay, so on the expanded access side, 11 states have bills right now that would have no, require no excuse. 
Uh, Andrea, I don't know if I should list these states or not because they might be numbing, but I can give you a list. I can send it to you and you can post it later. What, what would you like me to do? Um, it's in the PowerPoint. So you can give us okay. numbers and okay. then on, okay. on a lot of the PowerPoints, I actually put this okay. on the bottom. Yeah, now again, this is probably not a complete up-to-date list because for example, it didn't include the uh, felon restoration bill in Georgia but it listed 15 states that will restore felon voting rights. 13 states would require, would add same day voter registration. Eight states would require drop boxes. 12 states would require this cure, which means if you, if you make a mistake signing the envelope, they will contact you, you can fix it and it will be, be counted. So those are all really positive, and many of those things are also echoed in what's happening at the federal level in HR1. So now let's look at the bad stuff, because this is what um, we always end up fighting. The big frame here is that they're trying to roll back access to a ballot so that it's harder to get it in your hands. Remember, I remember at least, Dr. King said in 1957 at the Lincoln Memorial, give us the ballot. He didn't say give us voting rights. He said, give us the ballot because he had voting rights, but you couldn't get a ballot. And so surrounding the process of getting a ballot and returning it, these are proposals and fine print to make all that harder, not just for voters, but for officials. And that's part of the problem. They could be allies here because they don't need added bureaucracy. So let's just go into some of it. So um, they want to limit access to who gets a mailed out or absentee ballot. They want to impose new or stiffer ID requirements for returned absentee ballots. They want to limit or roll back voter registration options, including same day registration, some options for students on ID in states where student voting is really important, like New Hampshire and Mississippi. And they want to allow for more aggressive purges. So the states with the most regressive bills, the by volume are in descending order. It's Pennsylvania, it's New Hampshire, it's Missouri, it's New Jersey, it's Texas and Georgia. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through a few, uh, just a few more things and then we can talk about this. The states that wanna make using a mailed out ballot harder, what are they trying to do? Well, first of all, they're trying to eliminate the no excuse provision. So that means they wanna reinstate this requirement. That's Pennsylvania, Missouri, and North Dakota. They want to shut down or, or restrict what they call permanent absentee voting or early voting lists. And that means you, if you're over 65, you automatically get a ballot in the mail in states like Arizona. Um, it's a little bit crazy because in Arizona, a lot of Republicans vote that way. Um, they want, this is important for the folks on this call. They want to restrict advocacy groups from mailing and collecting applications. And what does that mean? It means that um, you have to actually show more ID or go jump through more hoops to be able to do that if it's not just banned outright. Now this is New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Texas, Washington state and Arizona. Then when the ballot comes back in, they want to they, it, it institute new ways to, to reject these returned envelopes. So what happens is an envelope has to be checked in, like a voter gets checked in at a polling place and they look at the signature and if it's okay and they look at the address and everything is signed the right way, goes into another pile and it's opened on election day. So in Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina and Virginia, they want to require more ID be submitted with the return ballots or even have the, the envelope notarized. Now, some states already do this, but again, this is just to create bureaucracy, create delays and create deterrence. Um, in Pennsylvania, they want to require new signature matching standards because this was in law. Um, the, the Democrats have fought this a lot. I don't, it's not necessarily something that's bad if it's done well. The question here is, is it, can it be done well? And what I mean by that is they look at the signature on an absentee ballot envelope and what do they compare it to? If they, if they like the state of Oregon and they compare it to voter registrations, driver licenses, absentee ballot applications, tax forms, got a lot of signatures, it's not going to be a problem. If you are like Florida and you have a couple of you know Xerox pieces of paper, and, and I've seen this happen, and they go, I don't know, that doesn't look right, reject it, that's a problem. So that's, so 
So that's in Pennsylvania, but probably other states as well. And they want to reject ballots that are postmarked by election day, but arrive after election day. And this is Kansas and Pennsylvania. And amazingly in Iowa, they don't want a ballot to be mailed any later than 10 days before election day, which is really something. So um, other states want to require an ID to, for you to get a ballot when you are voting early. This is in-person early voting. And this is Minnesota, this is Nebraska, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Washington, Wyoming. They want to narrow the range of accepted IDs. And this targets college students. This is New Hampshire and Pennsylvania. Um, in New Hampshire, this is especially for the presidential primaries. Um, for voter registration, the, in Texas and Mississippi, they want to include proof of citizenship. Now, in Texas, they um, in Texas they want the all new voter people who registered to vote to have their citizenship be clear, cleared by the state police. That is a, going to be a major, major problem if that has any traction, because you have an agency that has no experience doing this whatsoever, and who knows how long it will take, and it, it will just be a nightmare. Um, it's, it, and then um, three states want to eliminate same-day registration, Connecticut, Montana, Virginia. And then um, on voter purges, they want to, Miss, Mississippi wants to allow more databases, which is basically bad data that's never been, that wasn't originating, wasn't developed to be used for election purposes, to be used to remove voters. So that's something to watch. So I will stop right there for now. Um, you, you know, I, I, all I can say is when you look at the, I'll say one more thing. How do you assess what the chances are for bad bills and good bills? Here's how I do it as a reporter. The first thing I do is I look to see, and I, I go to Ballotpedia, and I look to see which states have Republican or Democratic majority legislatures and governors. Because if, there's, if it's called a trifecta, and something like two thirds of the states are trifectas, it means that they're all controlled by one party. So for example, a lot of these bad ideas in Virginia are not going to get through because Virginia is a blue trifecta state. States where it's split, like Pennsylvania or Kentucky, where you have a different Demo governor and legislative majority, means that it's not quite sure what's gonna happen. It's more up in the air. The other thing I look to next is also on Ballotpedia, whether these gubernatorial vetoes can be overridden by legislatures. And most states do not have, there are some where they have these super majorities, but they're not in a lot of the swing states. So basically, um, a lot of this comes down to Republicans pushing back where they can, Democrats pushing forward where they can, and it's going to create a landscape where you know, progress on, that will frame progress, not just at the state level, but at the federal level too. Because what's happening in the states will bubble up and you know, people will say, hey, you can't do this. Look at what we're trying to do here and vice versa. So I'll leave it there. And um, it's, it's remarkable. 500 bills introduced since the since start of the year, 80% of them are pro-voter to it put into law many of the things that enabled the high turnout in the fall a fifth of them 100 plus are to roll back stuff even further than before the pandemic stephen thank you very 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 much let's do a bit of a q a um one of the questions that I'm looking at, one of the last ones entered into the chat is, can you address the drawbacks of requiring a social security number or the full social security number? Virginia is one of those states where in order to register to vote, it requires your full social security number. And I know when registering voters, people who have moved into Virginia from out of state are always kind of taken aback by that. They're like, what? Because this is the ultimate in privacy information. If I've got your name, 
your social security number and your date of birth, I can now, if I am that kind of person, I can go and get into all kinds of devilment in your name. Right. So um, what I have seen with what's happening is states are trying to do a better job with verifying voters and managing their lists because when people move and die, they don't tell election officials. So they have to figure out who moved and who died and what's current. So what they've done is they've tried to look at, at other government databases to verify people's identity and, and, and track them. But these databases weren't designed for voting per and election purposes in the first instance. So what happens is you always end up getting certain kinds of problems and you, or you get lags where things are out of date. So with the social security database, for example, um, it may have your address. And I think you told me this, Andrea, not listed at where, as your residence, but where it might be your bank, because if you are on, so if you're over 65 and you get social security or 66 and, and it goes to the bank, it may have the bank address. And all of a sudden that's what's being checked instead of your actual home address. And, and all of a sudden you're flagged then it becomes a problem. And, um, so, and there are other examples like this. And, um, in, in, in 2018, um, hundreds of thousands of voters in Missouri and, and Arizona and Georgia, or people who registered to vote, didn't have their voter registration forms processed in time because it ran into this kind of what I called, instead of voter suppression, I called it data suppression. Because it didn't, the, the, the information they were using to vet these voters wasn't current and wasn't complete. So what all I'm saying with this is, as we move into a more, even more of an information oriented, you know, big data society, it's gonna affect voting. And we have to make sure that the information that's used to, to vet voters and approve us um, is, is the right information and, or, and is valid. And that's, it's a problem. I'll just leave it there. It's, it's not a perfect world by any stretch. Uh, Stephen, I'm going to ask you to address this question. Would HR1 make all of the restrictive voter laws illegal? No. HR1, HR1 does a lot of really, really good things. I mean, I went through it. And I, by my count, it, it has elements from over 50 bills starting in 2007. And some of these are audit bills and registration bills. And, but what it doesn't have in it is things that might be important to you if you're on, in a certain activist fold. For example, it does not restore what the Supreme Court did in 2013 to gutting the Voting Rights Act. It's not in there. It points in that direction, but it doesn't say do it. And that's why there's the John Lewis bill, which is in the Senate and um, introduced, I guess, in both chambers. There are other things that are not in it as well. And you know, it's gonna be tough because we don't wanna have the perfect be the enemy of the good. And a lot of people are um, thinking that, oh my God, this is not in it, that's not in it. And, and I won't even li list some of those things, but, um, but no, it, 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 it doesn't. It, it, it's, it, it, the thing that would make the Voting Rights Act, um, what, what makes it John Lewis Voting Rights Act, I have it here, whatever the formal title is, if more the effective- For the People Act. Yeah, no, but the, yeah, but this is not in the For the People Act. This is, I, I'll find this in a second. Uh, the Voting Rights Advancement Act, if yes. you're looking for John what it, Lewis's bill, what it the does VRAA. Is, what it does that is, is that it allows the Justice Department to either reject or accept any changes in voting laws or procedures in states that have come under scrutiny because they had voter suppression histories, because they had racist policies in the past. And it's not just states, it's some counties. And some of these are not just in the South, by the way. You know, some are in New York State, some are in California. Yeah, so it doesn't have that. It has a lot of other things that are very, very positive that point in that direction, but it doesn't get that 
go that far explicitly. And I was told that by election lawyers. Um, I saw another interesting question in the chat. Um, basically, Congress has the ability to set laws and rules for what must be done in federal elections. So HR1 says that for vote by mail, every eligible voter must be able to vote by mail and there will be no restrictions, but that relates to a federal election. So when you have interesting states like Virginia, where our federal elections are one year and our state elections are another, the question becomes, are the states determined enough to suppress the vote that they implement and run two sets of rules for their elections. Theoretically, they could. The assumption is they really wouldn't want to do that because elections are very, very expensive things, especially when they're statewide and it's the entire state house but it, it is going to be a very interesting question. This is an area, um, what you're pointing at here is something that we're gonna hear a lot about. Um, and traditionally states that, states have followed the federal guidelines for running state elections because it's just simpler for election administrators. They've just, they have a hard enough time doing what they're doing with new gear and new rules and new laws right the first time rather than unlearning. And, um, and by the way, that's some of what these Republican proposals would do. They would force people who adapted in the pandemic to, un to, 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 un to unlearn. So, um, the, so the, the thing that's real, that really is important um, about this that's gonna come up is the Republicans that were filing all these lawsuits for Trump and who were mimicked in Congress when they were tried to reject the electoral college votes in Pennsylvania and Arizona, have this insane untested theory that basically says, because Article Two of the Constitu federal constitution only says that states will set the time, place, and manner of voting, that, that, that state legislatures, that nobody else can do it. Governors can't issue edict, emergency rules for health or anything. Secretaries of state can't do it. State Supreme Courts can't do it. And they went judge shopping to try to find federal courts or, or, or circuits to accept this. And it didn't have traction. But the Republicans are very persistent. And this is a very useful theory for them because what it would do is it would basically allow them to overrule all of these accommodations at the state that, that might be made that didn't come from legislatures. And we have to see how that plays out. So what ends up happening here is un really unfortunate. Um, and it's this, you get these unnecessary ambiguities between state and federal law that get become ex points to, that can be exploited in partisan litigation. So it, for example, I expect you will see some of these claims saying, well, you could do this for federal, but you can't do it for state, or you could do this for the state and you shouldn't do it. It's, it, it's, it's, good. it's gonna be a lot of this kind of noise. It's going to be a lawyer's employment um, um, act. And, um, and by the way, that's why the federal laws, H, proposals, HR1 and the Senate bill were written in such a way that if they're challenged in court and something is defeated, only that section is removed. The whole thing doesn't go down. It's not like they like they tried to take down Obamacare and, and wipe it all out, and they couldn't. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Stephen. And there were questions um, in the chat. And one of the reasons why our new direction, especially in 2021, will be to help become more civically engaged, not only at the federal level, which is where many, many people are engaged, 
but the voters that we call and we reach out to, um, all those rural community of color voters in many, many instances are in Republican districts and the, their state representatives are pushing these questionable laws. So we want to make sure that citizens know what is going on in their state house and have an opportunity to call their elected representative and say, don't you dare support that. I was one of the 1 million black citizens in Georgia who voted absentee because I didn't want to get sick. So don't go changing those rules. So remember in Georgia, they're saying, you would have to send in your photo ID. That's got your name on it. It's got your name, it's got your address, it's your driver's license, it's got your driver's license number on it. So you're putting that in the mail, not once, but twice. So imagine people in the elections office getting all this paper. Do they have protocols to properly dispose of this privacy information that is now in their hands? What are they going to do with it? So it, it really starts causing a lot of privacy concerns, not to mention, we always talk about our older rural black voter. What if the only place they could get a copy is five, 10, 15 miles away and they no longer drive? So this is obviously a deliberate, well thought out attempt to say, let's see how hard, complicated and convoluted we can make it. But right now there's only the one sponsor of the bill, the guy who introduced it. So it will be very, very interesting to see where that goes. We are currently, we thought the bill was going to go in the house, but the Georgia Speaker of the House indicated he couldn't see any need for this and people were gonna have to show him why this was necessary. So I think they decided let's go introduce it in the Senate. So this is when the new tools where people who are on our mailing list can directly email their legislators in their state and put in their two cents about how they think about it because legislators feel if nobody's watching them, they can continue to do whatever it is they want to do. You know, Andrea, there's, there's one thing I would just add to this and it's, it's taken me a number of years to really understand this. Um, and this I think is really important for, you know, your, your crew and folks to, 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 to understand. In the voting world, there are two kinds of public officials. There are the elected officials, and then there are the civil servants. And the, uh, the, civil, the culture of the civil servants who tend to be the county, the county officials and those who hire the poll workers, um, it's, it's a service oriented culture. They're following directions. They don't speak out and defend themselves against the loudmouths who tend to be the electeds. You know, in, in government, the elected officials say, oh, I've got an idea, I'm gonna put it in a bill. And then, some, and then the bill passes and then somebody else is like, oh God, we gotta make that work. How do we figure that out? Those are the civil servants. And the reason I say this is not just sort of for people to know who they're talking to and is that local election officials, I would, you know, most that I have met over the years, I would say 98% of them have been dedicated to helping people vote. And they're not, but they're not used to defending themselves or speaking out. And that means they need allies. And a lot of these bad bills are just gonna make their jobs 
unnecessarily harder. They don't need more paperwork. If you th think about this for a second, if you have to put a voter, a, 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 um, make a photocopy of your ID and put that in your, with your return ballot in Georgia, how much extra work is that? How much extra time is that when you've got 5 million ballots coming in in the past, the last two weeks? And when you have, when things take more time, people can make all the noise about, oh, the process is illegal, Ill illegitimate, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm almost saying is they're allies and they're unrecognized by a lot of activist groups and activists. And all you need, folks need to do is show up and, and ask them, how did things work? And let me watch, especially when it's not a major election and no one else is there. And, um, and then you'll be able to really talk to these people and maybe you know they can introduce you to your local legislators who can say, "Hey, wait a minute! You know this person is not nuts. This person, you know, is talk. Spend five minutes." And 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 I've and I've been a legislative reporter since the '80s, and I've seen that, and I've been covering these officials like this for almost 20 years. So um, I just mentioned that because. There's such a blizzard of details; it gets so overwhelming. But but still, there's a people to people aspect here. And you're dealing with a culture of people who don't defend themselves. Think of it, um, nearly a million people were poll workers and election officials, and they didn't respond to those, how many of all, how were people were behind the Republican noise this fall. Right, right, right. So thank you, Stephen. And yeah, B, I'm going to echo your comment. Many people of color in rural areas do not have copy machines or scanners. And I'm also going to add many people in urban areas don't either. How many people do you know who have computers but don't own printers? So Stephen, thank you so very much for joining us. It is always an absolute total, total uh, delight, uh, right? There's another one, it's like people under 30 don't have printers either. So yeah, that makes me chuckle. Um, I hope that we can have you back in a few months when we can look at, have uh, more bills been introduced? Have we passed any of our big federal legislation? And then what are you seeing in the various state houses regarding implementation. So that is really what I am looking forward to, the implementation of the good legislation that is in the For the People Act and also the good legislation that will be in the John Lewis voting uh, Rights Advancement Act. And that bill isn't introduced um, in either the House or the Senate. We had it in the 20, in the 116th Congress. They haven't reintroduced it yet. My thought, and now this is purely my thought, is that maybe they were waiting for the final and full seating of the Georgia delegation and they were going to have the Georgia delegation bring that bill out in honor of John Lewis. That was kind of maybe more of a wish than actuality because in the 116th Congress when John Lewis was there, that bill was HR4. So it is yet to be introduced. So thank you so very much. Stephen, and I've got a couple of more screens I want to share with you. So our upcoming events, we have got a lot of events that are going to be coming up. On February 4th, I'm going to be doing a civic engagement training. Why we do it, how we do it, what are the forms that it can take in the age of pandemic when we may not be able to go into elected official offices. So there are Zoom meetings we can go to, and then there's also the ability to 
call our legislators and we've invested in tools that make it very easy to do that. So many people don't have any idea who their state legislators are. And there's still a lot of people who really don't know who their federal legislators are. So we've got tools, you put in your name, you put in your address, and then it pulls up your legislators and it says, okay, you want to talk to these people, click here, and then we're going to call them. Here's a script, say this, or say something similar to this, and then go down to the next person. So we want to make it easy and feel very doable so that people will do it. On February 11th, I'm going to do another board update. We're going to be looking at where more legislation is. We'll be showing off the new tools. We'll know how they work by then. They're so new, we're still learning. On February 18th, we are beginning our new series. Some of you may remember from last year, we did the Voting in Trouble Time series. Our new series, and there's going to be several of them, one of our new series is called Accelerating Justice. And for our very, very first um, item in our series, we'll be joined by Senator Mujaba Muhammad from the North Carolina State Senate. Gabby and Reverend Rodney will be here and Vanessa Gonzalez. And they're going to be examining the Blue Ribbon Task Force results from North Carolina that talk about racial justice in the criminal justice system. And what we're hoping for is that it will give people ideas on how they could do something very similar in their state. On February 25th, we will have another series begin and that will be Southern Voices. And we will have folks talking to us about climate justice and what that looks like in the South and how many of the ideas that people in non-impacted states were progressive and were even okay are not okay and they're actually environmental racism. So we'll be working on coming to terms with that on February 25th. So that will be our Southern Voices series. So we'll be talking to people in that series from Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, and going all the way around to Georgia. So for so many people, these may be getting to hear the ideas of people who live in an area that is very different from where you live, who have needs and who have ideas and concerns that there really aren't too many people outside certain areas of the South where this is a big concern. So we're going to make sure that we start hearing those other voices that are out there and we just normally don't get a chance to have a conversation or listen in on a conversation from people from those other states. I'm gonna stop sharing and look to see if we have other questions. Thank you, um, Suzanne and Nancy and Carrie, um, that for handling these other questions in the chat. Um, uh, all right, I see a question. Yes, we will still be writing postcards. Most of our postcards are probably going to be around federal legislation because remember, a federal bill we have two years to work on. Many of these state legislatures are going to be acting up to go home 
um, at the beginning of March. So it's going to be a little hard to postcard for some of our state legislators. Depending on when the bills come out, we might be able to do some things in North Carolina because they're going to be in session until July. So we're going to be looking at being very fleet, very nimble. Yes, we will continue to use all of our tools, postcarding and phone banking. We will also have the opportunity when we're talking about federal legislation where we will be able to participate as well because it's 218 votes to pass anything in the US House. And that means we're going to need representatives from a lot of different congressional districts and quite possibly yours. Is there anything else that anybody needs me to address? Yes, Andrea, let's have a Steven Rosenfeld series. Um, well, I, I hadn't quite had a chance to talk to him about that, but I was certainly thinking about it. So yes, um, I'm seeing questions about, will there be opportunities for texting? And the answer is, we would have to figure out what that program would look like. Um, I'm going to say yes. One of the things I wanted to do in Virginia was we had a certain stance where our climate bills, our moratorium on fossil fuels and Green New Deal bill, um, the Speaker of the House had not put those bills in committee. So someone had the idea, let's text constituents that are in her district and tell them that she is not putting those bills up so they can get a vote. I had an idea, let's go text the environmental donors in her district and tell them that she's not putting that bill up for a vote. So yes, there will be some opportunities for texting. They're probably going to be really small list and they're probably going to go really, really fast, but they're going to be out there. And yes, I am glad that everybody really enjoyed Stephen Rosenfeld. Yes, Stephen, Thank you so very much. And something that almost never, ever, ever happens, we are going to get done early. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, and now remember Virginia has um, our elections in 2021. So the last time I looked, Normally, whenever I look at the unregistered voters in Virginia or voters that have been deregistered by the Board of Elections, normally that's about 280,000 people. This year, it's 468,000 voters of color that have been removed from the rolls in Virginia. No, we will not be addressing the filibuster. It's going to happen much too fast. So thank you all. Everybody have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time and take care. Bye. Good night. Oops. Stop the recording.